In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. The Catholic Church does not believe in predestination to hell. It does not believe and does not profess that God creates people with a sentence of hell on them. That is Protestant. But it does believe in the predestination of the elect. That is that God chooses certain souls, and this is only in the secrets of the Blessed Trinity itself, certain souls to go to heaven, and that he plans their salvation and gives them all of the graces necessary for that salvation, including the grace of final perseverance, final repentance. It is a great mystery, but it is clearly stated in St. Paul. And the church teaches that those who go to hell go through their own fault because God gives to every man the sufficient grace to save his soul. And when God orders someone to be one of the elect, he orders everything from all eternity about that person in order that he be saved. And this includes the family that you are born into, the school you go to, the priests and religious in your life, if any. Every single thing about your life is pre-ordered. And not that God forces you to do anything, because he would actually have to destroy your humanity in order to force you. He never forces you to do anything, but by a mystery of his grace, he draws you where you ought to go. St. John the Baptist was a priest he was a priest of the Old Testament because his father and mother were both of the priestly order. In the Old Testament, you were a priest if you belonged to the tribe of Aaron, which was the tribe of Levi. If you were born into it, you were a priest. And so the priesthood was by generation and flesh. He was a priest. But he was a priest that never offered a sacrifice in the temple, as the others did. They would offer bulls and heifers and all sorts of animals in preparation for and as a prefiguration of the blood of Christ that would be offered on the cross. The Old Testament is loaded with those sacrifices that are prefigurations of the sacrifice of the cross. And so every day, animals would be sacrificed in the temple. But St. John the Baptist, although a priest, never offered a sacrifice in the temple. Instead, at an early age, he went out into the desert and led a life of extreme penance, of obscurity, as if he were a nobody. Some may have considered him to be odd. His appearance would have shocked us, having not shaven, having not cut his hair. And this was all on purpose by God, all ordered by God, from all eternity. Because the Jews of the time needed to be shocked. And this is why the great saints also shock us when we read their lives, so that we imitate them even in our own little way. He led a life of preaching, preaching the coming Messiah, a life of baptizing, a baptism that did not give grace, but nevertheless, was a prefiguration of the baptism of the New Testament. And the sacrifice that he finally offered was the sacrifice of his own life, 
greater than that of any of the animals of the temple. The sacrifice of his own life because he professed the truth. He professed the truth that Herod's marriage was unlawful and invalid. And for that, he was the object of hatred and finally murder. And so it's very appropriate that we ordain a priest on this feast of the greatest of all of the priests of the Old Testament. The priest of the New Testament is ordered by God also from all eternity. God conceives of us in eternity. He sees our lives. He sees the graces he will give us. And so there is a plan of salvation for those for whom he intends the holy priesthood. Part of his plan of salvation for everyone is the state of life that you are meant to lead. Most are called to the married state. where their salvation consists primarily in the Catholic upbringing of their children. For why does God give you children except that they be brought to him by your instrumentality? That is your mission as a married person, to bring your children to God and you will have to answer to God for how you did that. And some are called to the single life. Their salvation consists in obedience to the commandments of God and of bearing the crosses of single life, which are many. And some are called to the religious state whose salvation consists in the pursuit of perfection under their rule. But some very, very privileged souls are called to the holy priesthood, the greatest of all of the vocations, as it conforms the man most to the sacred heart of Jesus conforms him most to the incarnation of our Lord, conforms him most to the act of redemption and to all of the mysteries of our Lord. Indeed, he is another Christ. God calls us and speaks to us not in words usually, rarely it happens but by inspirations and inclinations of the heart which are produced by actual graces and gifts of the Holy Ghost. He puts an anchor in our hearts, a weight in our hearts to do something. He inspires us with holy thoughts. And this he does in a special way with those destined to the altar of God. There is something in them that is not explainable by any natural means why they desire this, why they desire to be a priest. And they become victims just like our Lord Jesus Christ, just like St. John the Baptist. And this comes in the form of handing over his life entirely to the service of God, his glory, which glory consists in the offering of the holy sacrifice of the mass, a strong prayer life on the part of the priest, and an apostolate for the salvation of souls, for God is glorified by the salvation of a soul. And his whole church is set up for the salvation of sinners. And he has made the priesthood for sinners, to draw sinners to himself. 
It is a great calling. It is a, a privilege that defies even our understanding. Like St. John the Baptist, there is for the priest no self-enrichment, no matter how talented or intelligent they should be. A person that might make millions of dollars in the world. There is no self-enrichment. He gets enough to live on. That's all. There's no pleasures of marriage. There is no consolation of wife and children. And he offers himself to God in a daily holocaust of chastity, as Pope Pius XII said. The young men called to the priesthood today are called to be priests, not in a flourishing Catholic church of old that we can see in pictures, we can read about. A Catholic church filled with billions of people professing to be Catholic. And seminaries and convents loaded with candidates, religious brothers, monasteries, all loaded with holy people, beautiful churches, all the result of the sacrifice of so many ancestors and deep sacrifices. It's all gone. The vineyard is devastated. It is like Jerusalem in the Old Testament, which was sacked and leveled by the Assyrians. And during Holy Week, we read the lamentations of Jeremiah, who was the prophet that told the Jews, you're going to be leveled and sacked. And they didn't hear him. They thought no one could tear down the Temple of Solomon. And they answered him by saying, the temple of God, the temple of God, the temple of God, and mocked him. And sure enough, the Assyrians came, Nebuchadnezzar, and did their job. And by analogy, we have the same thing. Jeremiah, in these lamentations, is sitting on the rubble of Jerusalem, weeping at what happened to Jerusalem, the beautiful jewel of Jerusalem, the magnificent temple of Solomon. He sits there weeping. And so we are lamenting this devastated Jerusalem. We too sit in our own church, which is infested with modernists, and we lament its former glory. Listen to what Jeremiah said. And we read this in Holy Week. Concerning Jerusalem, he said, To what shall I compare thee? Or to what shall I liken thee, O daughter of Jerusalem? To what shall I equal thee, that I may comfort thee, O virgin daughter of Sion? For great as the sea is thy destruction, who shall heal thee? We say the same. How will the church ever come out of this? Who shall heal it? And he continues, All they that passed by the way have clapped their hands at thee. They have hissed and wagged their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem, saying, is this the city of perfect beauty, the joy of all the earth? When we look upon St. Peter's Basilica, where there is a procession with an idol, a Pachamama, and we say that, is this the city of perfect beauty and the joy of all the earth? 
and we cry as Jeremiah's cried. And he said, the kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should enter in by the gates of Jerusalem. How prophetic the modernists came in by the gates and they destroyed the Jerusalem of the Catholic Church by their heresy, by infiltration of the hierarchy. And we see it and we cry. Who would have said in 1958 that we would be here When Pius XII left the church in October of 1958, he left it in beautiful condition. Who would have said that the enemy would have entered by the gates and done this destruction? Jeremiah said, our inheritance is turned to aliens, our houses to strangers. We are become orphans without a father. And he said, concerning these enemies that penetrated, they abused the young men indecently. And he finishes by saying, the joy of our heart is ceased. Our dancing is turned into mourning. This ruined church, not extinguished, but certainly in ruination, is the church that these young men are signing up for as priests. So to become a priest in these times requires an extraordinary courage since there is no telling what the future holds for them. Look at our nation, who would have thought even a year ago that we would have seen the darkness descend upon it that we see today. What was more stable than the United States of America? And now we see chaos and anarchy run free without any intervention of the government to stop it. Who would have said that? And the same is true of the church. And we say, why does God permit this? It is always our question. Why, when the church was in such magnificent condition in the 20th century, why did God permit this? Why are we sitting on the rubble of Jerusalem weeping? And the answer is in St. Paul. It's very simple. He says, for there must also be heresies that they also, who are approved, may be made manifest among you. That is, God purposely permits heresies in order to shake the tree of the church so that all of the rotten fruit falls down. Because he will not be mocked if you profess the Catholic name He wants you to believe right down to the the sinews of your flesh. And he wants you to profess the faith perfectly and with strength and conviction, so much so that you are ready to give up your natural lives in order to preserve your faith. He will not be mocked by a profession of the lips, and he will from time to time shake that tree and prove those who are fake from those who are true. For all of these reasons, the truly Catholic priest today, whom we ordain this day, should be held in the highest esteem more than ever. Priests should always be held in the highest esteem. But more than ever, these are exceptional men. 
in very exceptional times. They have tremendous interior courage to do this. The priest should be respected. Often he is not. He should be obeyed whenever he is imposing the law of faith, the rules of Catholic morality and Catholic modesty, for example, or the rules of canon law. He should be obeyed, for when he is imposing those rules, he is participating in the royalty of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is an agent of Christ the King when he is imposing those things, and he should be obeyed and not ignored and not told, well, that's your opinion, as many of us have been told. And even his opinions and his advice to you in spiritual matters should be taken very seriously. And the priest should be supported for his decent sustenance. And sacrifices needed to be made in order to obtain and maintain churches, schools, convents, and seminaries in order that the life of the church continue. We cannot do it without those sacrifices. And if you see the great structures of the church that have now become houses of modernism, it is because your ancestors sacrificed a great deal with much less than you have today. And as much as possible, lay people ought to empower the priest and his apostolate. The more tools you give him, the more he can do. And finally, in this octave of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, we turn our thoughts to the Sacred Heart and to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Our Lord's heart is sacred because of the grace of union with the second person of the Blessed Trinity. And so we adore it with the same adoration that we give to the Blessed Trinity itself. And Our Lady's heart is immaculate because there is not the slightest sin in it nor even the slightest sinful inclination in it. It is immaculate. It is beautiful because of that. And so may the white hot fire of the Sacred Heart of Jesus burning with love and mercy for sinners. Inspire the priestly heart of this young man all the days of his life. And may the white hot fire of the love of God and detachment from all sin, which we behold in the Immaculate Heart of Mary, be his daily example in order that he lead his life of the priesthood in humility, chastity, zeal, and stainlessness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.